I'm going to get you started because we're going to start in Matthew 21 with uh, Palm Sunday, with the, uh, with the triumphal entry. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of them, ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, there's two details that, um, because all, all I do, you know, on these kinds of year, uh, times of the year is I just read it fresh for myself and I see what's there. So we'll do that again with Easter next week. But um, there were two details that I, I don't think I've noticed till now. And, and one question that was especially relevant for today. And um, there's a translation, translation called The Voice that I have used before. Um, the Voice was created by, written by... Um, Authors, artists, musicians, poets, you know, just that whole creative community. And then they were uh, submitted to a bunch of scholars and stuff like that so they didn't go too far off base. But it's very creative. It's very fluid. It's, it's very beautiful to read. It's just not always mm, quite accurate. Um, but anyway, the voice translation captures some of the drama of this moment, but this one doesn't. So I'm going to read part of this again, but I just want you to remember something. Okay, so we all know the story of the, of, the, of the triumphal entry. And again, I'm encouraging you to read that to your kids this week and, and read it for yourself this week uh, from other uh, parts of Scripture, from Luke and from John and from Mark. Um, but do you remember what happened prior? So I'll tell you. What is happening is that Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. Jesus has, and it's like, uh, I forget the actual Greek and stuff, but he is resolute, he is strongly, he is headed beeline for Jerusalem. And he is picking people up along the way. There's an entourage beginning to form. There's a crowd beginning to form. And in fact, you might remember the story of um, the blind man on the side of the road. And the crowd begins to pass by and he begins to shout, hey, Jesus, uh, son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd tries to shut him up. And then, of course, Jesus stops and the whole crowd stops. And then Jesus calls the, the blind man to him and the blind man is healed and he joins the crowd, right? That is the immediate thing that happens before the triumphal entry. And that's important because Matthew 21, 1 in the voice says this, Jesus, the disciples and the great crowds were heading toward Jerusalem when they came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives. Jesus stopped and beckoned to two of his disciples. So he's about to send them down. So, yes, there were people in Jerusalem. Yes, maybe some heard that he was riding into town and went out to greet him. But the crowds that we're talking about on the triumphal entry are probably primarily those that have been with him and have been kind of gathering around him as he approached Jerusalem. Now that's important because, again, from the voice, listen to the people in the actual scene. It was the disciples that spread their cloaks on the donkey, and then Luke 19.8. So this is from the Luke account. The great crowd followed suit, laying their cloaks on the road. Others cut leafy branches from the trees and scattered those before Jesus. And the crowds went before Jesus, walked alongside him, and processed behind, all singing, 
Hosanna, praises to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So that's the detail that popped out at me that I don't think I've ever thought about before and noticed was that this crowd of worshipers was the same one that has been traveling with Jesus for quite some time. Ever since he set his face toward Jerusalem and started kind of gathering these people, these people, as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, this crowd has been growing. It's been growing in size. It's been growing in excitement and anticipation and hope. And, you know, there's all this kind of fervor around him that he's going to overthrow Rome and everything's going to be okay. And that led to my question. And it's exactly what you said, um, ironically enough. Um, and that is, I have been reminded over the course of decades and over many, many sermons that this crowd will in less than a week be shouting crucify. Okay, but here's my question. Jerusalem, I'll get to the question now. Jerusalem was roughly about the size of Galesburg. That shocked me. I thought it was much larger. Um, but Jerusalem was roughly 35, 40,000 people, which I think is what Galesburg is. But at Passover, it would swell to 200,000. So if you can imagine 200,000 people roaming around Galesburg, you know, life is not going to be the same for anyone in uh, Jerusalem right now. So what if the crowd that was following Jesus into Jerusalem didn't turn on him? If there's 200,000 people that are swelling Jerusalem, I don't know how many people were in Jesus's crowd, but it wasn't that big, <laughs> you know? He fed 5,000 men once. So you're thinking at most, that's probably 10,000, maybe 12,000 people on that day. So at the most, there's probably 10, 12,000 people with Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. And there's 140,000 in Jerusalem. So what if it was those that were already there or those that kind of got sucked up into the crowd mob mentality those were the ones that were shouting, crucify him. What if um, the crowd, the crowd of worshipers who followed Jesus into Jerusalem were like the disciples by the time he hit the cross? Just silent. My, my question was that, what if this crowd that is heading into Jerusalem with Jesus and hoping that this is the moment, and then everything goes sideways, what if instead of them being the ones shouting, okay, he's failed us, crucify him, what if instead of that, they, like the disciples, just got defeated and quiet and just kind of shrunk? Because that, that makes a lot more sense to me. That, that, that lines up with what happened to the disciples, the rest of the disciples. And so that's the deal that I got to thinking about, because don't you sense that happening over the past several years? I, I, I've given some of these kinds of examples before, but, um, you know, I, I just, as I was thinking through this and praying through this, I, I thought of some more things. Um, I've been in the church, like I said, for decades. I was in the church nine months before I was born, uh, but I don't really remember a whole lot until about the 80s. And the 80s for me, and I don't know about you, but the 80s for me in the church was all about spiritual warfare. That was huge everywhere. The 90s, church growth. That was when Saddleback came into being. That, uh, that's the Rick Warren's church. That was when uh, Bill Hybels had his whole seeker-sensitive thing. The, so the 90s, church growth. The 2000s, I believe, were characterized by worship. That's when Chris Tomlin and uh, Matt Redman and all these other worship bands and worship leaders began to really, you know, come into their own. I'm going to ask you a question. What is it that is driving the church right now? Can you answer? As a whole, like I realize I only grew up in kind of a little section. I mean, I grew up in the suburbs of Kansas City. I realized that I only grew up, up in my own little fish pond 
of churchdom. But still, no matter where you went, no matter what you listened to, all the Christian music was about spiritual warfare, et cetera, et cetera. Do you know what's driving the church right now? I don't. And you're looking at me blank because you don't either. <laughs> in response, I, I've mentioned this before, in response to a pandemic that has killed half a million people in the face of this rapid, rapid culture shift, unlike anything any of us have ever seen before, is there any strong, um, united call to prayer? I haven't seen it. Haven't you seen a bowing, a surrender to, I guess this is just the world as it is. I guess this is just, this is the world we live in. See, I see some nods, so um, I'm going to go ahead with this, but have you sensed in the church quieting in a bit of a retreat? So I think that's what ended up happening after Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus comes in, and the first thing he does, by the way, is cleanse the temple, which <laughs> just ticks everyone off. And pretty much, you know, anybody following him at that point is like, oh, it is real now. And then, you know what happens next? Kind of just disappears. He, he does a lot of very quiet things with just his disciples. He washes his disciples' feet. He takes uh, part in the very last supper, you know, the, the last Passover. He just kind of disappears. And so, a lot of these crowds that came in shouting, you know, uh, Hosanna in the highest are kind of like, well, what now? And then they begin to hear that, oh, he's been crucified <laughs> or he's been arrested. And then they see, you know, that he's been sentenced to death. And then they see the crucifixion. And I think they just went quiet. I think they felt defeated. So then I asked myself the question, what could they have done differently? And what can we do now? How do we maintain our worship? How do we maintain our hope, our excitement, our enthusiasm, our charge hell with a water pistol kind of uh, ideal that once drove some of us and the church in general, especially when it looks like things are headed in the opposite direction? That uh, guy started a blog, actually, or somebody started a blog about this um, I forget what it's called. It's like preacher kicks or something like that. Okay. Huh? Sure. That's the guy. Yeah. And uh, last I knew what he had done was he was posting photos and prices and he had like a running tab of how much money all these pastors were spending on shoes. It was just shoes in this case. By the way, I don't mean to disappoint anybody. I'm very, very sorry. These are $40 and um it came from one of the sporting goods stores around here um, about a year and a half ago. So sorry to live such an opulent lifestyle. Um, but so here's the thing. Blessed is the name of the Lord came from Psalm 118. So the disciples didn't put it together until later. Uh, they thought back on all of this. And this is, this is from John. Uh, at first, his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him. Psalm 118, from which Hosanna and the highest is taken, is just like that. It's told in a reflective kind of manner. It's not chronological. It's not easy to follow. It's kind of more just like thinking back and um, reflecting on it. And, um, you know, just like we do our own lives. But if you pick through it a little bit, we can see what happened. So this is Psalm 118, and we'll spend the rest of our time here, um, whatever little bit we got. Um, give thanks to the Lord for his good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his love endures forever. Why? Why are we so excited? Why are we talking about how much God's love means to us? Verse 5 says, when hard pressed, or some translations say, in my anguish. The Hebrew actually means from a tight spot. 
like literally squeezed in to a tight spot. From a tight spot, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place where he answered me by setting me free. If you skip down to verse 10, you can see what was happening. All the nations surrounded me, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. That is the background of Hosanna, because what Hosanna actually means, it's in verse 25 of Psalm 18, is Lord, rescue us. This is not good. All these things going on around us are just terrifying and, and they're just everything is changing so quickly and, and Rome is uh, uh, oppressing us and it's just not good. And we thank Jesus that you're the hope. Help us. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. So the big picture here is, I was in anguish. I cried out. He answered by setting me free. The Lord helped me and gave me victory. Now, the rest of the psalm, much like those first few verses, verses, is praise and worship because of that victory. So verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. Um, I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. Verse 22, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Uh, verse six is kind of, leaning more toward, well, it kind of leans more toward future. It leans more toward instruction. It leans more toward encouragement. Uh, the Lord is with me. Therefore, I won't be afraid. What can mere man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. So what are we saying here? <laughs> I, I oversimplified it, and it just happened to wind up with alliteration. I didn't make it have alliteration. It just did in my head. But there's two different patterns at work. And there's two different patterns at work in all of the Christian life. There's two different patterns at work. I think I see it in the, uh, the triumphal entry, um, and it's this. There's anguish. There's the tight space. There's the, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? There's the anguish and, and the crying out from that anguish, right? Everybody has been there where things are so desperate, so dark, so scary, so unknown, so uncertain, so kind of, what are we going to do? that you just cry out. So there's anguish. And then there's the answer. God comes along and rescues us. God comes along and uh, in, the, in that Psalm, it says that he set us free. So then there's the answer. And then you get a whole lot of awe because the rest of that Psalm, a whole lot of that Psalm is just like, wow, you're so good. I can't believe we ever even like, questioned you this is just amazing because here you are again and it's just it's praise and it's worship and it's all so you've got that this is one pattern that we see i mean again you're nodding at me which is awesome by the way um you you get it and you've, you've experienced it. anguish and answer and then wow right so that's one of the patterns that's constantly at work in the christian life the other pattern that 
I'm seeing by the fact that maybe these crowds that came in aren't the ones that shouted crucify, is that here's what begins to happen also. You get the answer, you get the awe, and then time passes and it begins to fade just a little bit. And then something else kind of begins to creep into your world and you begin to just kind of get a little bit afraid again. You begin to kind of think, um, well, God answered that time, but it's, it's looking tight again. I'm feeling anxious again. So it kind of begins to fade and then there's this little bit of fear and then we fall into silence. The silence of the disciples at the cross who have abandoned them other than John. The silence of Saturday. The silence of Sunday morning when the women went to the tomb expecting to find the body. The defeat. So what do we do? We do like the disciples did in John, and we do like the psalmist did in Psalm 118, and we reflect. We look back. See, it was when they looked back, they realized when we were crying out, um, blessed be the name of the one who comes in the, in the name of the Lord, and rescue us, Hosanna, <laughs> he was right there. On Sunday morning, on Monday morning, on Tuesday morning, when word begins to spread that Jesus actually is alive again, that's when it begins to kind of click into place and they go, so when we were saying Hosanna, bless him, he really did come in the name of the Lord. He is the Lord. When we were saying rescue us, we thought he meant Rome. Now we know he means sin. He means the darkness that has just covered my entire being. He means to rescue us from far more than we think. I think this is anguish. I think Rome attacking me is anguish, but there's actually deeper anguish inside of me that Jesus has rescued me from. I get it now. They looked back and they reflected. Um, and if you really go back to Psalm, they sang again. Um, and that's why this last detail was important. Very quickly. Luke 19, 28 says, when he finished the parable, he pushed onward, climbing the steep hills toward Jerusalem. That's that set his face. And for several months now, he's been looking at his closest friends, his disciples, and saying, boys, I'm going to die. And, and there was just something about, again, this is from the voice. He pushed onward, climbing the steep hills toward Jerusalem. Parentheses, toward his own death. Strongly, courageously, with a ton, more than we can imagine, of love. And when he sat down with his disciples at the Last Supper, when they enjoyed that final um, Passover together. Guess what the last psalm was that they sung? It's Psalm 118. So I'd like us to close our eyes. And um, I would like for you to imagine the upper room, however you picture it. Uh, da Vinci's The Last Supper is probably not a good representation. <laughs> so you got lamplight, flames in oil lamps in the corners. You got flickering shadows. You have 13 men gathered in this room who are as close as close can be. And they're enjoying Passover, a traditional meal that Jews have been celebrating for thousands of years. And hanging over the room is this 
truth that Jesus has spoken, that he keeps saying, this is it. Boys, I'm going to die. And he's washed their feet and he said some strange things and there's just kind of a, a solemnness to the room. And frankly, the disciples are about to abandon him. They're about to fall asleep in the garden. They're about to run away when he is arrested. They're about to stay their distance when he is crucified, all except for John. <coughs> and before all of that takes place, I just want you to imagine Jesus and the disciples singing these words. Jesus singing these words, knowing what is about to happen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done many things, mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, palms, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Keep your eyes closed, but there is a, a different possibility for translating verse 27 in Psalms. It says, with bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. It may mean bind the sacrifice to the horns of the altar which would be really unusual because that is nowhere in the law to tie it down. But historians say that there were times where there were so many sacrifices, where the altar was so full of animals being sacrificed, the pile so high, that they did have to tie it down in order to keep it from falling off. If that's the proper translation, then as we close, I'd just like you to consider that as Jesus sang that song, he fully recognized that in the next few hours, he was going to clear the altar of every sacrifice but his own. And every shortcoming that you and I have, and every sin that we struggle with, and every time that we bow to defeat, and every time we fade into silence, and every time we don't, aren't moved by his goodness, and everything, everything was about to be covered with his one sacrifice. So there's two patterns at work. 
there's that anxiety and anguish followed by the answer, followed by the awe of worship. And then there's also that part of our lives where all that fades. We begin to give in to fear again and we fall into silence. And I'm suggesting that one answer is to look back. I'm suggesting that one answer is to sing it again, just as they did Psalm 118, what it meant at the triumphal entry and what it meant at the Last Supper and what it meant days later when they looked back and figured it out. So I'm asking us to look back. Father God, I just ask that you would fill our minds right now with memories of your faithfulness to us. We just sang about your goodness coming after us our entire lives. Fill our minds with images of your goodness chasing after us. Fill our minds with blessings and hopes fulfilled and, um, and, and not just stuff. Fill our minds with times that we had no peace whatsoever and then you just invaded and you gave it to us. Fill our minds when we were just so ashamed of what we had done yet again and yet you came and you forgave us and we felt it and we knew it. Fill our minds with your mercy and your grace and, and examples of, um, of everything that you've ever done and are doing and promised to do. Let us look back and see, and uh, as, as John puts it, you know, that they didn't understand, and then they did. And that's what gave them courage and hope to Praise again, to get out of the silence, to get out of the defeat, to cry out. Thank you for that, in Jesus' name. Amen.